So I'm an ophthalmologist. I'm trained as an orbital surgeon. I'm also a scientist. And one of the things in the lab that we study is the process of Graves' eye disease because there is nothing that I would like more than to put myself out of business as a surgeon. That would be the thrill of my life. Because what we do to treat this disease, if you think about it, is pretty terrible. We uh, need to address and treat normal tissue in order to accommodate the abnormal tissue. The good news is that the results are very good. The um, surgeries and experienced hands are very safe. And um, uh, overall, for the patients who, who need that type of surgery, the outcomes are, are quite excellent. First of all, I have no conflicts of interest in this talk or the next one. Unfortunately, some people might say, but... Um, so the evaluation of the Graves patient, you can think of it as pretty cut and dry. Okay, there's a history, there is an exam, so key part of the history is do they come to you with a diagnosis, or like many of you, you go to the doctor with protruding eyes, and that's how they diagnose the Graves disease. Um, and that may take you in different directions, but um, then you have the exam, and there is the visual acuity, there is the pupils, do they function, does the optic nerve function, how do the eyes move, is there double vision, um, is there eye pressure, is there eye pressure, is, does the pressure inside the eye elevate in upgaze, which happens in a lot of patients because their muscle under the eye is so tight that when you try to look up, it really squeezes the eye. Uh, and many Graves patients will walk around with a slight chin-up position that puts their eyes in a more comfortable down gaze position as they look out into the world. They don't oftentimes even notice it. Um, she has it right over there, just a little bit. But it's, it's basically universal. If you have a, a large, tight, inferior rectus muscle, um, you'll assume just naturally a slight chin-up position, which makes it more comfortable. And there's nothing wrong with that, as long as you're not doing this and killing your neck. Um, lid position, obviously there is retraction, upper lid retraction, lower lid retraction. Sometimes there is unusual ptosis or drooping of the eyelid, and that's where you need to really make sure that there's no myasthenia gravis, which is also an autoimmune disease and can coexist with Graves' disease. Um, obviously, proptosis, the protrusion of the eyes. Interestingly, it's the patients who don't protrude that are sometimes at higher risk for compressive optic neuropathy and vision loss because there's not that natural decompression that allows the eyes to expand, the tissues to expand. If the lids are tight, they're keeping all that expanding tissue pushing backwards on the nerve, and that's how you can actually go blind. The ocular surface, the tear film, the conjunctiva, which is the skin of the eye, it's clear. You're supposed to see right through it into the white of the eye. But if you have chemosis, which is edema or swelling of the conjunctiva, that's kind of what hangs out. That can look like a bubble. Sometimes it's red. Sometimes it's not. Um, it's a part of the congestion and edema of the tissues. Um, obviously, looking at the retina in the back to look at the nerve and see, make sure that everything, just because you have Graves' disease, doesn't mean that that's what's causing all of your visual symptoms. We need to make sure that everything else is excluded so that, or make the proper diagnosis because the diagnosis is really what drives all the therapy. Uh, looking at the nerve, palpating, seeing if there's resistance to retropulsion to get a sense of whether it's a tight orbit or not. So this is all the numbers and all the details, and we can fill sheets and sheets and sheets with, with this information. And it's very important information, and it both drives treatment to some extent and allows us to assess treatment outcomes. But the numbers only tell part of the story. So I'm going to tell you another story. And uh, this is, we'll call her Samantha. She's a patient of mine who walked into my clinic just a couple months ago, a few, few months ago. This is uh, late, late spring. And she's 18 years old. She comes in with her mother. And she comes in because from northern Michigan, drove six hours. She has protruding eyes. And they know that this might be Graves' disease, so the doctor sent her to see, see me at the Graves' disease uh, eye clinic. Here's the story, and you tell me, as I'm telling it, if you recognize it. She is 14 years old, and we'll go back four, four years. 
she's a teenager, and she is beginning to be a bit unruly. Her grades go down. She starts talking back to her parents in a way that she's never done before. She can't sleep. She has a really hard time sleeping. She loses 40 pounds in the course of five months. She's 14. The pediatrician says, teenage girls will be the father of a teenage girl. But things continue. She really can't sleep. She fails out of school. She yells at her parents. At age, she starts smoking. They take her to a psychiatrist who diagnoses her with bipolar disorder, gives her psychotropic medications. You know what? Do you think those worked? They didn't work. At 16, she runs away from home, drops out of school, moves in with a bunch of people that are from the other side of the tracks. And family is devastated. This is a completely normal, wonderful girl who suddenly went off the deep end. And they're going around telling their friends, our daughter has uh, manic depression, and she's not responding to psychotropic medications. They want to put her on lithium and all of these terrible things. And um, she basically lives like this for almost two years. And then her eyes begin to protrude, except that she wasn't on speaking terms with her parents. She was stealing from their home. She was doing all sorts of crazy things. And her mom sees her and says, we've got to go to the doctor. She forces her to go to the doctor, who sends her to me. And I had to write a letter saying she doesn't have bipolar. She never had bipolar. Her TSH is terribly, terribly suppressed. Her TSI is very high. And she needs to be fully evaluated for Graves disease. She actually had a thyroidectomy this summer in August. And um, right now, this is just a few months later, her parents are finally getting their daughter back. It's like an alien took over their daughter, lived in their daughter's body for several years. And um, she was crying throughout most of the exam just because she's emotionally labile. Now that this process is over, her mom is the one crying, saying, gosh, I get, I get my daughter back. So this is what's so different about this disease. We can focus on the numbers. We can focus on the blood tests, um, on the um, progression of disease, and what a great job we can do as, as surgeons to, um, to make patients look good again. But the all of this, the person behind all of this is... Um, is a human being that is in terrible distress that they can't properly vocalize. And it's only in hindsight, and that's my experience, in hindsight that they say, gosh, I can't believe I said those things. I can't believe I did those things. Um, and I, I just w don't want to, anyone to forget the context. And this is, in my opinion, a key, key part of the evaluation. And what does that mean? It means spending with her an hour, actually more, and it's very hard to get that kind of time from um, doctors who don't necessarily know what this disease is about. But people who know, I mean, Dr. Douglas has a slot in his clinic that's twice as long, three times as long. I have the same thing. We have slots in our clinic schedule where we basically say, the hell with the schedule. This is a Graves' disease patient or a possible Graves' disease patient, and we need to schedule it so that we have a time to sit down and talk with them, explain the disease process, answer their questions, get to know them, gain their trust, get a sense for their bigger picture. Um, because that is, I can do the exam in under 10 minutes. But the rest of it takes a long time. So the bottom line... Is emotional, I'm just going to read this, the emotional evaluation of patients with eye disease is a critical part of the overall evaluation. You have the context of facial disfigurement and eye pain and discomfort in the context of the emotional flux that characterizes the disease. And to quote Clinton, or paraphrase, it's not the eyes, it's the patient. Okay? Now, recognizing thyroid eye disease, is um, it's not trivial for people who don't see it all the time. You can go for years and not know what's going on 
excellent doctors may see you multiple times and not know what's going on because it's insidious. Some of it is sometimes it's explosive and then they send you directly to the right person. But other times it's not. Most endocrinologists who, have, who are you know, very knowledgeable about this disease by and large take care of diabetes patients. There are only a relatively few percentage of the endocrinologists who really have a high percentage thyroid population. Is that, wasn't, wouldn't that be correct? And, and they're missing a lot because some of these patients never make it to these subspecialists. And for those who live in large academic medical centers it, in, or near them, uh, it may be easier. But if you don't, um, you really need to be your own or your child's or your loved one's best advocate and make sure that they're getting the care that they need, even if you love the physician but if they are not paying attention to the things that you think are important and are not listening to you. One of my professors in medical school said, patients know what they have, they just don't have the knowledge and verbiage to express it properly in medical terms. So if you listen to the patient and you put that in medical verbiage, you have the diagnosis. We don't actually need to do all that much thinking, we just need to do a lot of listening. Now, who will get thyroid eye disease? Um, women are significantly more commonly affected than men, even though men, especially middle-aged men, when they have Graves' eye disease, uh, it seems to be more severe. The timing can be all over the place. So in evaluating these patients, you can't really make uh, a, um, a prediction on whether someone with Graves' eye disease that doesn't have Graves' disease will develop it tomorrow, next year, in the next five years, uh, or someone who has Graves' disease and not the ophthalmopathy, mm -hmm. when they'll develop the ophthalmopathy, if at all. We just don't have enough information, clinical or uh, biological, to make those determinations. Of note, see in the bottom, 20% of patients with thyroid eye disease are youth thyroid, meaning normal thyroid, at the time of um, the diagnosis evaluation of their eye disease. And the good part is 85% of thyroid eye disease patients have relatively mild symptoms. Okay? And of course, the kind of population that I see is the more severe type. The kind of patients that might be involved with this organization may be the more severe type. But the good news is that most patients with Graves' disease don't have vision threatening, terribly disfiguring type of disease that you can see on the other side of the spectrum. So this is particularly bad. These are pictures taken from the web. And you get on the web and it scares the heck out of people. And some of it is uh, true and some of it is just the 0.001%. That's not you, but you're afraid that that's gonna be you. As we talked about before, it seems to have a predilection for the eyes in orbit, the tissue around the eyes, as well as for the and so ophthalmopathy, or the eye disease, and dermopathy, or skin disease. The course is self typically takes three years. It has a rapidly progressive phase, and then it's sustained, and then it quiets down, and then it slowly continues to improve. never getting all the way um, uh, to normal. But the goal is to get you back to where you were so that um, no one who looks at you would say, ah, that's a Graves' disease patient. People should look at you and say, that's a person. So here's a patient with mild to moderate disease who came to see me. And in this kind of a patient, supportive care is important while always being vigilant for worsening. So his eyes are very irritated and tender. Things are painful, but he does not have double vision. He does not have compressive optic neuropathy. I'm gonna see him on a regular basis, make sure that there's no progression, and address his ocular symptoms, which are related to his exposure and ocular surface inflammation. And I'm gonna talk about that in a bit. This is a patient of mine with very severe disease. And he is a man who um, was fired from his job because he attacked his co- I mean, he just went nuts. He went crazy. He was talking, he was swearing, he was disrespectful to his bosses. They said, get the heck out of here. And then he developed 
this based on his eye disease. He was diagnosed with Graves' disease. And um, the goal then is to get him back to the point where he is functional. I'll show, him, I'll show you what he looks like at the end. But, and then subtle signs. So on the, on the patient's right, on your left, um, she has a higher upper eyelid than on her other side. She came in to see me with um, uh, drooping of her left eye. She said, my left eye is drooping suddenly. The reality is that her right eye is retracting because she has subtle findings of the beginning of Graves' eye disease. And based on this, she was diagnosed with Graves' disease. She, did, she never really progressed a terrible disease. She had some eyelid retraction, and that's it. So it, the numbers are clearly important. The physical exam, very important. And a patient like this hears that she has Graves' disease, goes on the web, sees the pictures, and just that is enough to drive people crazy. And that's where a, a support group and a foundation group like this are so important to connect these people with others who have gone through it because what you do for patients is beyond words. Um, you really help patients see the light of the end of the tunnel and know what to expect and have a peer or peers that you can share experiences with that really few, if anyone, understands. And by the way, I think there should be a similar foundation or support group for the spouses of people with grave disease. Well, that's as an aside. The challenges are we need better assessment tools that will allow us to know which patients are going to progress to the terrible disease and which are, um, would benefit from just supportive therapy, what we sometimes pejoratively call hand-holding, but that's what it is. We just make sure that the patients are well taken care of, that there's nothing bad that's going on, and, um, and we'll deal with the rest of it once the disease quiets down. And a key part is the communication and collaboration among physicians from different fields so just bringing together um, endocrinologists and thyroid surgeons and uh, radiation nuclear medicine <coughs> specialists and ophthalmologists uh, of different types, the strabismus surgeons, the orbital surgeons, sounds easy, but it's very hard to do. At the University of Michigan, we actually have a Graves' eye disease uh, team, and we meet regularly to discuss patients and compare notes and refer to one another. And it's, it is easier to do in an academic center, but still most academic centers don't even have it. So it's very important, and again, you need to be your own best advocate. If your endocrinologist is not communicating with your ophthalmologist or vice versa, demand it and say, you know what, send me a letter or CC me on the letter so that I can then walk to my other doctors with those letters so that people know what's going on. And every time that you have a blood test, have your doctor send a copy of the results of all the blood tests to all the doctors that are taking care of you. Because one, it's important for all of them to know. And two, so that they don't repeat the test. There's no point in taking a thyroid function test and then three weeks later, take it again. You know, because nothing has changed. Unless it's a unique situation, if you're just in the course of the disease, it's, it's not gonna change. You don't need all these sticks. I just put this picture in to um, remind people what's the pathogenesis or what's the effect of the disease on the tissues. This is a cadaver sample taken from a textbook. And on the left, it's a CT scan from a patient of mine. But you see the muscles and how enlarged they are, the fat expansion. Everything behaves in a way that it shouldn't. That's the only time where I see this normally is in the embryo when the tissues develop, which is why I've been studying these signaling systems uh, in the embryo and trying to compare between the embryo and the adult disease state. So here's this patient that I showed you earlier. Uh, this is after the compression of his right side. This is just a week later. So you can see that he has about, about a third of an inch difference. And he was, he was um, losing vision and steroids um, really didn't help. So uh, he need, by the time he came to see me, he already had significant compressive neuropathy on the left side and the early compressive neuropathy on the right. Or maybe the other way. I think the other way around. Um, <clears throat> so here he is after the decompression, which removes normal bone, but it just allows the tissues to expand. 
Here he is after his decompression, but he has terrible strabismus, which is the misaligned eyes. He has terrible um, eyelid retraction, both upper and lower. Here he is after the strabismus surgery. And here he is when so all is said and done. And he got the job, and he is back as a normal member of society. And he says to me, gosh, the terrible things I said and did, I can't believe it. And I told him, it's not you. You were taken over by an alien. You really were. <laughs> and you need to forgive yourself. And all the people who love you will forgive you. But you know, what, these kids, what these people go through before the diagnosis is really hard to imagine. But you guys know, you don't need to imagine. So this is another patient of mine who came in with terrible eye disease, and he had radioactive iodine ablation. And after that, he actually had a massive worsening of his eye disease. He ended up getting a, um, and he was losing vision from compressive optic neuropathy. Uh, we temporized things um, temp with, with steroids, but eventually, until he got the thyroid out, and then eventually, um, that's a different patient. That's after the strabismus surgery, and here he is after everything is said and done. And uh, he is a very successful businessman back to his normal life. Uh, I put this in to show what the misaligned eyes are. And this is what we look at when we do an evaluation. That patient right in the center is looking right at you, at least with the left eye. But the right eye is looking down. Um, and he really can't bring that right eye up. This is a patient who primarily has a unilateral disease. It's amazing. But it's true. And it's been like that for a year or two. He's an engineer, was laid off at Michigan because he lost his job like many other people, was unable to find another job. Because he got a lot of interviews, very, very successful, outstanding engineer. Comes to an interview, can you imagine this guy interviewing and getting a job? People are just not going to give him a break. They can't not think about what's, between, what's in front of them and just focus on what's between the ears. So he did have reconstructive surgery and he does have a job now. And he's thrilled. This is a very young patient, a girl, a patient of mine. I put this on just to show you what the lag of thalamus means. Again, we are looking for that, which is where the eye gets dried out because the blink is not normal, as Dr. Douglas was saying, and the eye doesn't close completely when you sleep. And I'm going to talk about that, all that in my next uh, lecture, which is just, just a few minutes. Um, here is a picture of an elevated tear lake. I don't know if you guys can see this. But the tear lake reaches all the way up here. It should just be there. Can you see it? Okay. So sometimes, because the eye is so irritated, it just keeps tearing, and those tears accumulate, and it's look, like looking through a swimming pool. And, um, and that's, these are all characteristic of the, of the disease. It's, yeah. Well, it turns out that if you treat the instigators, which is the irritation of the eye that is causing the eye to tear, it will tear less. So it seems counterintuitive to make a wet eye wetter. But what she really has is an inflamed ocular surface and um, an irritated ocular surface with dry eyes, with sand in the eye. So um, lubrication potentially plugging or cauterizing the puncta, which are the drains, the drain tears. Um, there are mass cell stabilizers if there's any component of allergic conjunctivitis, which some of these patients have, and I think some of you have, that's going unrecognized that you have. Symptoms much worse. And some the topical steroid for brief stasis, which is the Sporin. Again, it depends on the patient, and it's not uncommon to try different things before finding the right mixture that uh, gets the patient comfortable. Th there is no magic bullet. Now, does anyone know this lady? No. Now? Two years ago, Laquilla Harris came to me wearing a patch. And um, 
she was living right next to one of the world's preeminent medical centers where she's been followed and treated for three years. And their solution to her problem, to crawl under a bed and wear a patch. That's a quote from L'Aquila. And so she asked me, can you do anything? And the response was, yes, we can. And so she came to Michigan, where our multidisciplinary team took care of her. This is Dr. Archer uh, on the right. He is the strabismus surgeon. And really, it does take a team, and she was seen by the neuro-ophthalmologist and um, by the whole group that um, needed to take care of her. And before the go blue, actually, you know, I'll put the go blue, but Laquilla, come. The Patient and Family Conference present an award to Dr. Olan Kahana in appreciation of your exceptional contributions for 2011 program to the doctor who has changed my life and gave me a new look on life. I love you and thank you. Thank you. This is, this is wonderful, but don't, don't go anywhere. Because L'Aquila has a can-do attitude, and she would not stop until she found a team that could take care of her. She was her own best advocate. And what I did for her is not really anything special. The reality is that a team of surgeons who are experienced in this can take care of her. And that's what we did. If she, had gone, she went to me, but she could have gone to any of my colleagues who do this regularly and it would have been the same. The point is that in our institution, we have a team that takes care of patients like her all the time. And, uh, and that's what makes our program somewhat different. But it's really a tribute to L'Aquila, who persevered and looked for a situation where she could be made better. And she is better. So congratulations, L'Aquila. And, and it take, the fact that he takes a team She's wearing the amazing blue shirt, and she had everyone who took care of her sign it. And you can see, you can see that there are a couple dozen signatures. <laughs> That's right. So it, it takes a team, it takes a group of people to take care of one patient. And that's how it is. Job well done. Yep. Thank you, Lekko. And thank you very much for this and for the invitation.